I will quickly pass this away to Mr. Michael Richards one more time for the FX conversation. Michael. Thank you very much, Simeon. And uh, it's uh, good to be back. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find my correct window. Oh, it seems to have vanished. Well, there we are. How's that looking? Looking good, go ahead. Fantastic, you're uh, I daren't even, I'm afraid, um, try to emulate uh, David and Paul's uh, wonderful tricks. So I'm afraid you'll just have to put up with me uh, in a little window. Um, okay, so. I want to talk first of all about the use cases um we've got to cover for currency conversion then about the uh architecture that we are thinking about uh, and finally about the potential structure of a foreign exchange or currency conversion api so uh let's think first of all about the use cases um so first of all we need to be able to support uh, a case where the dfsp performs their own currency conversion where they themselves are capable of uh, converting from one currency to another second uh one where dfsp pre-purchases currency let's say in bulk from an fs from a foreign exchange provider as it requires it and finally, where a DFSP uses payment versus payment to obtain conversion on the fly for an individual transfer from a foreign exchange provider. So if a DFSP performs their own currency conversion, there isn't any FX, uh, any currency conversion required by the system. Uh, the only requirement is that the DFSP must be able to provide liquidity cover in the target currency and the existing architecture of Mojuloop, I think should be capable of uh, handling that. So we wouldn't need to do anything in order to provide that. In a case where a DFSP pre-purchases currency from a foreign exchange provider, it means that the DFSP must have liquidity credit with the switch for the amount of the source currency, the currency it's converting. Um, the foreign exchange provider will remit the funds in the target currency to the DFSP, but they won't be available at that point for um, uh, liquidity cover for transfers in that currency. It's only when the foreign exchange provider settles that amount that the funds remitted will be credited to the DFSP settlement account for the purposes of funding transfers. So the funds will appear in the ledger and the position ledger at that point, uh, but they won't be transferred to the settlement ledger, which as Miguel told us, is the one that will be used to do the liquidity check until those funds are settled. Again, that will not require a great deal of modification to the way in which things happen now. So finally, uh, there's payment versus payment, which we at the moment are expecting to be the standard foreign exchange case for Mojoloop. Our plan is that it should be possible for either a debtor DFSP, the payer DFSP, or a creditor DFSP, the payee, uh, to undertake currency conversion. Uh, and that means that the transfer will always, the transfer itself will always be as it is now in a single currency. If the payer DFSP is doing the conversion, then the transfer will be in the target currency, denominating. Or if the creditor DFSP is to perform it, then the transfer will be in the source currency. Uh, and I will uh, I'll be showing you in more detail a bit further in the presentation how that will work. But in both cases, it's important to register that there'll be back-to-back -back cover in the participant's non-home currency, which will net to zero over the course of the transaction. So it should be the case that um, a no participant should ever have obligations outstanding except in its home currency. So the idea, as I say, is that uh, there will be back-to-back -back transfers into and out of the non-home currency account, which will net back to zero. So what are our objectives here? Well, first of all, we wanted to minimize 
the footprint of the foreign exchange provider, the currency converter. Um, I'll be talking a bit more about uh, that in a bit, but we don't want uh, foreign exchange. We want to essentially to have foreign exchange provision as a service, which is just about currency conversion. We didn't want um, foreign exchange providers necessarily to need to have uh, to need to provide other services, directory lookup, those sorts of things uh, that um, they don't that aren't really related to the conversion process. We also wanted to move the currency conversion process to the DFSPs to manage. Now, initially, when we started looking at this, we kind of expected that it would be the switch, the hub, which would be responsible for analysing whether or not a transfer needed to have currency conversion, and if it did. Uh, to um, uh, to undertake that uh, additional extension to the transfer to do the currency conversion. We think it's a cleaner and simpler model if we allow the participants to manage that. Uh, and I'll be explaining that uh, a bit later on. Next, we wanted to make transfers deterministic. Uh, we wanted to ensure that whatever architecture we adopted would mean that uh, we couldn't wind up in a situation where one part of a currency conversion transfer had succeeded and another part had failed. Uh, so that's an obvious uh, security requirement uh, that we have to have for currency conversion. And finally, we wanted, if possible, to make this a non-breaking change for the existing API so that people, we could extend functionality to include currency conversion without needing to, uh, to well, without needing people who are implementing uh, schemes that don't need currency conversion, without needing them to make any changes to what they do at the moment. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the proposed architecture. So currently, we have a two transfer model of currency conversion. Um, we were thinking about a two transfer, one transaction model, uh, but Mawali currently has a two transaction model. So there's one transaction that goes from the payer DFSP to the foreign exchange provider in the source currency, and a separate transaction that goes from the foreign exchange provider to the uh, destination, the payee DFSP in the target currency. We wanted, I think, to um, at least to have a single transaction uh, with two transfers so that at least we could report on uh, currency conversion transfers by transaction ID and therefore get both legs in the same report. Uh, there's a question there about whether there should be two condition fulfillment pairs, one for the foreign exchange provider and one for the creditor DFSP. Uh, but at the moment, uh, we haven't come to a decision about that. But in both cases, uh, the quote and the transfer are routed via the FXP by directly addressing the first phase of the operation, that is either um, the, uh, sorry, that is the, um, the initial source currency transfer to it. Um, and the foreign exchange provider would be a full participant in the transfer. It functions as a DFSP from the point of view of the resources it has to support. So it's essentially got to support uh, an extensive series of API functions, not all of which, as I say, are related to currency conversion. Um, but currency conversion is managed essentially through an extension of the existing FSP IOP standard API. And there was a problem in that requests for currency conversion were being made prior to the final terms of the transfer being known. Now, as we've said, um, when a transfer request is made, uh, which is when in our original design thinking, uh, requests for currency conversion were done, it's not necessarily the case that the amount that's being asked for is the amount that will eventually be required because, uh, as we know, it's only when the payee DFSP responds with the agreed terms of the transfer that uh, it's possible to understand what the eventual amount of currency conversion required will be. Uh, so that was a problem. Our proposed alternative is to say essentially 
Currency conversion is a matter between a DFSP and a single party. The transfer terms don't need to record the content of that agreement, and the FXP doesn't need to know either about the quote or about the transfer. It only needs to know about the currency conversion that it's being asked to provide. It should sign the terms, the FXP should sign the terms under which it performs the conversion uh, so that it can confirm both to its client and to the switch that it has explicitly assented to its part, the currency conversion, and has cleared the funds appropriately, in this case, to the requesting DFSP. And we wanted either the payer DFSP or the payee DFSP, or perhaps the switch, uh, to be able to request a currency conversion. That should say currency conversion, not transfer. So we wanted a DFSP to be able to request either wholesale or retail currency conversion in the same way. So it shouldn't be possible, it shouldn't be necessary for the, the foreign exchange provider to know whether it's wholesale or retail um, conversion that's being required. Um, for wholesale currency conversion, the conversion just gets executed and the converted funds are credited back to the DFSP's target currency account. FXP has to demonstrate liquidity cover, as we've said, and the funds won't be available until the FXP has settled them. For retail, i.e. per transfer, what we want to say is that the execution of the conversion will be dependent on a successful execution of an associated funds transfer, i.e. the transfer itself. If the transfer fails, the conversion should fail. Uh, if the conversion fails, the transfer should fail. It should not be possible for uh, either to succeed without the other to succeeding. Uh, and as we've said, uh, the back-to-back -back transfers in the non-home account, which will always net to zero. So <clears throat> we suggested that a DFSP should be able to use a services endpoint in the uh, FSPI op API, which we had already planned to introduce uh, for the PISP interface to allow a, a PISP to find out which DFSPs in the scheme offered PISP support. Uh, so we plan to extend that to use an FXP endpoint uh, so, that the, uh, so that a DFSP can get a list of any entities in the scheme which provide foreign exchange currency conversion services. So the two transfer model uh, works like that. Uh, the transfer one goes between the payer DFSP, transfer two in the target currency goes from the foreign exchange provider to the payee DFSP. The new model, if a payer, if the payer DFSP is doing the conversion says, the conversion request goes to the foreign exchange provider and it gets a response back, which is the currency in the target currency. The currency itself then is in the target currency. So you can see there will be a credit uh, from the foreign exchange provider of the amount uh, and a debit uh, of the same amount uh, as cover for the transfer. If the payee is asking for the conversion, then the transfer will be in the source currency. Uh, so the payee DFSP will use that source currency as uh, a um, as a transfer to the foreign exchange provider, the currency converter, and it will get its own currency back. Uh, so it will be able to disperse those funds to its customer. So. How does this work in the agreement phase? Well, as we say, the currency, well, as we say, uh, the currencies in which the beneficiary customer can receive funds will be returned as an optional part of the get parties request. So uh, the get parties request would be able to include a statement that says this account can receive funds in West African francs or South African rands or whatever it might be. The debtor DFSP will therefore be able to find out from that response whether the transfer will need currency conversion or not, because it will know what, account, what currency its customer's account can use. Uh, so 
it will know whether the transfer needs currency conversion. It can decide whether it wants to carry out that conversion itself or whether it's going to ask the creditor DFSP to carry it out. And currency conversion, we expect, will use the same structure as an ordinary transfer. It's going to use the same pattern, an agreement phase followed by an execution phase. So if the debtor DFSP is doing the transfer, you do the currency conversion process, the request, that is, for currency conversion before you request for quotation. The debtor DFSP asks for a list of foreign exchange providers and selects one. It asks the selected foreign exchange providers for a conversion quotation, specifying the source and target currencies and the amount required in one or other of the currencies. The foreign exchange provider sets the terms in exactly the same way as the payee DFSP would for an ordinary transfer. It signs them again in the same way. It puts an expiry on them. It works in exactly the same way as for an ordinary transfer and returns the condition to the payer DFSP. When the debtor DFSP, the payer DFSP, sends the quotation request, then it specifies the amount of the transfer in the target currency. So, if there's the creditor, the FSP, who's doing currency conversion, then the process will be specified after the payee DFSP receives the request for quotation and before it responds. It expresses the amount of the proposed, sorry, the payer DFSP expresses the amount of the transfer in the source currency. The creditor DFSP asks for a list of FXPs and selects one. And it then asks the selected F foreign exchange provider for a conversion quotation, specifying the source and target currencies and the amount required. Again, the foreign exchange provider in exactly the same way sets the terms, signs them and returns the condition. Now, when the creditor DFSP sends the quotation request response for its transfer, it specifies the amount in the, of the transfer in the target currency in the payee receive amount, which is a field already there in the quote response. So nothing needs to change in order for that to happen. Uh, and that means that the debtor, the FSP, will be able to respond to its customer <coughs> and say both the send, receive, send amount and the receive amount in their different currencies. And again, it won't have to do anything different from what it does now. So now I want to talk a little bit about how we're going to ensure deterministic outcomes here. And our idea is to do it via a concept which we're calling at the moment dependent transfers. So the requirement is in a payment versus payment transfer, there's going to be two actual transfers. We got to have a situation where either they must both succeed or both fail. And of the two transfers, we are expecting that one will be subordinate to the other if a deterministic outcome is to be achieved. So what we're saying is that if one succeeds, the other must. So our solution is that we define one transfer as the primary and the other as the subordinate. When the execution of the subordinate transfer is requested, the execution request contains the transfer ID of the primary request in, in as part of execution request. And what that means is that when the payee DFSP or the currency converter approves the subordinate transfer, this means I approve it subject to the primary transfer being approved. So in relation to this, <coughs> In relation to the conversion, the, pay, the currency converter, the foreign exchange provider, is effectively saying, I am happy with this transfer. I resign my right to cancel it to the switch. It's, it's effectively making a promise which is exactly the same as the promise which the payer DFSP has made to the scheme by issuing the payment execution request. The payee DFSP 
sorry, that's the foreign exchange provider here, should reserve funds in its accounts, but should not irrevocably transfer them. And as you've doubtless seen, this is equivalent to returning the transfer request with status reserved, i.e. it says, I will wait to see whether this transfer has succeeded or not, whether this currency conversion has succeeded or not. When the switch completes the primary transfer, it informs the parties to the secondary transfer of the secondary transfer's outcome. And that means that it's only at that point that the switch will record the secondary transfer as having completed and that the foreign exchange provider, in this case, will be able to actually clear the funds to its accounts. So that's what we're proposing. For example, in our, in our currency conversion architecture, funds transfer is the primary transfer and the currency conversion is the secondary transfer. So the currency conversion succeeds if and only if the transfer succeeds. In the Mawali 2 transfer model, which this would also support, the source currency transfer, payer to FXP, is the primary transfer, and the target currency transfer is the secondary transfer. So that means the target currency transfer succeeds if and only if the source currency transfer succeeds. And this offers a way of achieving a deterministic outcome even in the two transaction model that Mawali uh, implements. So we can already see that this dependent transfer model is enabling us to solve problems beyond the simple question of how to manage the difference between currency conversion and uh, the actual transfer. So this is potentially at least a candidate for generalization. Uh, it's a pattern that could be generalized across Mojaloop. Uh, it could be extended, I think, from two to multiple codependent transfers. So that, for instance, the primary ID might mean all transfer requests which share this dependency ID. So, for instance, where a bulk transfer is composed into multiple per DFSP bulk transfers, which is just something we talked about yesterday, uh, the dependency model could be used to allow the overall bulk transfer to fail if any of the component bulk transfers fail. Uh, now, we've said at the moment that when we issue those requests, some will succeed and some will fail and that's just the way it's going to happen. So even if there were only one transfer in the payroll which succeeded, that person would still get paid even though everybody else did. This enables us, if we want to, to say, no, if for any reason we can't pay them, make the payments that we expect to be able to make, then we will cancel the run. And if we do that at the batch level, for instance, we might we could allow individual payments to fail, payments to individual customers whose accounts might have been suspended, but we can still allow uh, the overall payroll to fail if, for instance, a whole DFSP is unavailable or offline. Uh, we could also use this to support the multi-payee transfer which you will probably recall, well, maybe you won't, but uh, it was proposed by SNAP. Uh, they wanted to be able to issue a transfer where, let's say, they were acting as an agent uh, for a football team. Uh, they sold a ticket, and the football team got most of it, SNAP got some of it, and the government got some of it. And the idea was that unless all parts of the transfer succeeded, all of it should fail. Uh, and this dependency model would enable us, I think, to support that effectively. So let's look at the question of executing currency. How much time have I got left, Simeon? Uh, you have 15 minutes. 15 minutes, oh great, plenty of time. Okay, so let's look at how currency conversion actually works. So if the debtor, the DFSP, the payer, is doing the conversion, it asks its selected foreign exchange provider to execute the conversion, and it specifies the transaction number on which the conversion depends. The FXP decides whether to approve or not. 
If it doesn't approve, then the transfer process stops. Uh, so from now on, we assume it has approved it. If it does approve, then as I've said, this is equivalent to the foreign exchange provider making a uh, making a positive response, uh, a post transfers with uh, status reserved. So the, the switch can finally determine the outcome. Uh, in this case, switch reserves a debit in the source currency against the debt of the FSP's account. It reserves a credit in the target currency against the debt of the FSP's account. Then the debt of the FSP requests execution of the transfer, which is denominated in the target currency. Switch reserves funds in the target currency against the debt of the FSP's account. They've already been covered, as we've just seen, as a consequence of the currency conversion. So this is the netting out. Uh, so the net on the uh, target currency account for the payer DFSP will be zero. It forwards the request to the creditor DFSP. If the creditor DFSP rejects the transfer, then the switch cancels the reservation of funds and cancels all the reservations associated with the currency conversion, which is a dependent transfer. The switch then informs the FXP that the currency conversion has been rejected, and it's exactly the same as it would be if the switch, if, uh, if the switch informed a normal payer DFSP that a transfer had been rejected. If the creditor to DFSP approves the transfer, the switch records a transaction which debits the debt of DFSP's account and credits the payee DFSP's account in the target currency, cancels the reservations associated with the currency conversion and records two transfers, a debit from the debt of DFSP and a credit to the foreign exchange provider in the source currency and a debit from the foreign exchange provider and a credit to the debt of DFSP in the target currency. And the switch informs the foreign exchange provider that the currency conversion has succeeded. So that is, oh, sorry, it also informs the debt of the FSP that the currency conversion has succeeded. So that basically works like this. We do a directory request, get a request for our local Rwandan francs, currency conversion request in uh, West African francs, response in Rwandan francs, and a transfer in Rwandan francs. If it's the creditor DFSP, the payee DFSP, who is going to, uh, to undertake the conversion, then the debtor sends a transfer execution request in the normal way. It's denominated in the source currency, and the switch reserves a debit in the source currency, exactly as it would in the normal circumstances, and forwards the request to the payee DFSP. The payee DFSP requests execution of the previously agreed currency conversion. Switch reserves funds in the target currency against the uh, foreign exchange provider's account. If the currency conversion request fails, then the switch cancels that reservation. The creditor, the payee foreign exchange provider, sorry, um, what I meant to say was the credit card, DFSP rejects the transfer request and the rejection is processed in a normal way. So all the uh, payer DFSP say, sees is a rejection by the payee DFSP of the transfer that it required for execution. If it succeeds, then the switch clears the reservations it made against the payer DFSP and the foreign exchange provider. It creates a debit from the debtor DFSP's account and a credit to the F FXP's account in the source currency. A debit from the foreign exchange provider's account and a credit to the creditor DFSP's account in the target currency. And the switch notifies the foreign exchange provider that it's recorded the currency conversion as successful. And now the switch notifies the debtor the payer DFSP and the payee DFSP, if requested, that it's recorded the transfer as successful. So it goes like this, directory request, response happens in the same way as it did before. 
when the quote request comes through, we get a conversion request in West African francs, and that's responded to with uh, Rwandan francs. And the transfer goes through, sorry, the arrows are a wrong way round there. That should have gone through first, the transfer in uh, West African francs leading to a conversion request. So what are we going to need to have in the foreign exchange API, which we are now having is a separate API. So a services endpoint, as we've already said, something to find out who is offering currency conversion services in the scheme. Then we have an FX quotes endpoint and an FX transfers endpoint, which are the currency conversion versions of the quotes and transfers endpoints that exist in the current API. Uh, and I think that's more or less it. Those are, the, it's worth saying that the quotes and transfer, FX quotes and FX transfers are the only endpoints that the foreign exchange provider needs to support. Uh, in the two transfers or two transactions models, it needs to be able to essentially support, be able to support uh, a large, well, a larger number of uh, of API endpoints because it needs to be able to do more than simply respond to FX quotes and FX transfers requests. It needs to be able to initiate quotes and transfers requests. It needs to be able to initiate uh, directory requests and so on and so forth. So it cuts down the footprint and therefore the uh, requirements for a foreign exchange provider and makes it easier for uh, a participant in the scheme to provide foreign exchange services. As we've said in the past, we want this to be a set of services so that it's very possible that uh, an, an entity, a DFSP, which provides other services, which is a participant in the scheme in other ways, should also offer foreign exchange services. So what do we need to do to the FSPI, the existing API, well, as we've said, we need a list of currencies, an optional list of currencies uh, returned from the put parties call in the FSPI op API. That means that in a scheme which supports currency conversion in this model, uh, the payer DFSP can understand and make the decision as to whether currency conversion is required or not. We need to extend the data model in the FS, sorry, that, I'll just say that again. That's uh, a, not a requirement. It's not a mandatory field, it's an optional field. Uh, the data model for the post quotes and put quotes calls should have an enumeration to allow the debtor DFSP to specify that it wants the creditor DFSP to undertake currency conversion or to allow the creditor DFSP to specify that it wants the debtor DFSP to undertake currency conversion. The reason we need this, and we did originally consider that it might be possible to infer from the currencies that were, uh, were in already included in the quotation request, whether currency conversion is required or not. But we figured in the end that that wasn't the case because in a situation where um where someone was sending uh with a receive was sending a receive amount saying i want the person to receive this amount uh it wouldn't necessarily be easy to understand whether that meant i want the person to receive this amount and i will be doing the currency conversion or i want the person to receive this amount and you must do the currency conversion so we thought it needed an optional separate identifier to do that <coughs> and the same in the transaction object. Uh, and of course, we will also need, uh, though it's not found here, uh, we will need something that enables the dependent dear, the dependent transaction UID to be set uh, so that we can link the two transactions with each other. So that is all I have to say on that. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, Michael, you might want to take a look through the chat. See if there's. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry, I've been uh, I've been neglecting my duties chat wise. It's certainly true. Uh, dunk, dunk, dunk. Uh, sorry. Yes. Okay. TV flow. 
No, they will all go through the switch. Sorry. Um, if it so, if it is the case that they don't go through the switch, as Miller says, then that's essentially equivalent to the first option, i.e., the DFSP is providing currency conversion itself. So this assumes that communications between the FXP and the DFSP was requesting conversion will be routed through the switch in the normal way. I think that if that were not the case, then what we would see is that funds that were con I mean, effectively funds that were obtained from a currency converter by the DFSP in whatever way would simply be credited to its settlement account in the target currency. And it would say, I intend to make this transfer and I'm going to do it in the target currency. What it wouldn't be able to do necessarily uh, is to send something through saying, I know that currency conversion is required, but you should do the currency conversion. Yes, so as, as you know, says, so dependent transfers means the switch is the, the ultimate source of truth uh, because it will be the person that eventually decides whether all of these transfers have succeeded or, how, or all of them have failed. Uh, okay, any other questions on that? Um, in which case, uh, if there are none, um, one final one. Yeah. Would you be able to run the visa I will. Now, my understanding is that the visa people are keen to do currency conversion themselves. They do it already as part of Visa Direct. Uh, and I would be surprised if they wanted to resign that ability to other people. However, they might very well want to, or might very well be interested in providing currency conversion services uh, in a scheme which wasn't. Uh, doing Visa Direct inbound transfers. So I would certainly do that, yes. Um, well, thank you so much, Michael. Do you have any last comments to wrap up? Any last comments? Uh, no, I don't think so, except to thank you for your, uh, uh, for your indulgence and to say that, unfortunately, you'll be getting even more of me later on this afternoon. <laughs> Looking forward to it, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> uh, yes.